Good morning and welcome to Kingdom Ministry. We have another exciting word from the Word of God today. We hope and pray that will help you and help us all. As we move forward into this, I'm asking you, as always, take note. You never know what you're hearing unless you go back and research it. You gotta go take notes. If we have any technical difficulties, anything major, we'll log right back on and we'll keep going. So get your pen, pad, notebook, uh, note paper, whatever you do, however you do take notes, get what you're going to get, let's go. It's imperative that you take notes so that you can go back and look at the material because there's uh, quite a bit of notes today. It's not a ton, but it's a, it's a little more than usual because I want you to see and hear how important history is and knowing history. If you don't know your history, if you don't understand history, then it's really challenging to really get a grasp on where you're at today, what's happening today, why is it happening, and it, it can kind of throw you off. You need to keep things in balance. Unfortunately, because a lot of the history was removed, a lot of the authors and books that were there, or people who were in that um, living in that time, those books have been modified, a lot of them. So a lot of the material you need, you're gonna to have to really do some searching for. It's not like it's just sitting there you're going to have to go and find a lot of these materials or a lot of these books, and that takes time. And that's a hard thing to say uh, for a lot of people who don't really like to read or don't want to, you know, take the time to grasp this. So <clears throat> please take notes. Uh, I'll do the best I can to keep it at a pace where you can keep up. And Father, we just thank you for the insight of your word. We thank you that it will pierce our hearts and minds. And we ask you to open up our hearts and minds and give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened. We need this, that we can clearly hear and see and understand what you're saying for us in every area of our life, especially in obedience to you and your laws, your precepts, and your concepts. And we thank you in the name of Christ, our King. So be it, Father. So it's important that as we uh, move forward into this today, that we continue on. This is Kingdom Insight, the church, part two. We've already established in part one that the church is Israel. It's in your manual, it's there. It's a term that is the word ecclesia, ecclesia is what they mean. It means to be called out. It's also where they get the word cabinet from or government, all right? So it's important that you understand God wanted to establish his government on the earth, and he chose Israel as his representative. Now, in what's coming new, and I'm, I don't deal with a lot of prophecy right now, we're moving, uh, going to move into that, and we're gonna, you're going to get some things, but because you need to understand, God is not developing Israel to fail. As a matter of fact, he's developing them to succeed, but there's some things we need to talk about so that you can understand what took place, all right? So let's start here with our notes. Please write this down. We're going to talk about Esau again. Because when you understand what's going on, then you'll understand why or what's happening with you or uh, your family or, or, or governments around the world or wherever you're at, what's happening. Because all that information, a lot of those books and, again, literature, even uh, writings of people that were there, again, were hidden, stolen, and they were also put in, play, put in a place where you couldn't get them. And, and again, once again, a lot of them were just destroyed so that you couldn't find the information. So, number one, Esau. When you look through the scriptures, you'll see you know, Esau, the twin. Remember, Jacob and Esau, they were twins. And they came from who? Isaac and Rebekah. Now, you'll see in the scriptures, you'll also see the word Edom. E-D-O-M. E-D-O-M. You're going to see that a lot in the scriptures. Edom. That's still the Esau. That's still Esau. And we, we proved last time in part one, if you haven't seen it, please go watch Kingdom Insight, the church part one, of all the foreign women that Esau married, including later on, on a study, um, some information, also a Amalek, which is the Amalekites, which means that he also got with them is what he wasn't, is not what was required. And, you know, Jacob, you know, moved away. Esau went with all the foreign women and did stuff because his father Isaac didn't want it, neither did his mother, but didn't matter. That's Edom. That's Esau. Also, you'll see the word that describes him 
as Adume. It's spelled I D U M A I D U M E A. I D U M E A. It is pronounced Idume. Now that's in the Greek, but that's the same word for the word Edom. So if you see Esau, if you see Edom, or if you see Idume, it's the same thing. It's all Esau. These are all Esau descendants and lineage. And I showed you last time that he integrated into all the world. I mean, he's in every culture, everywhere. He's, this, his descendants are, are all over. Now, again, Jacob's descendants or, you know, are going to be more, but it, it doesn't matter. What I'm trying to get you to understand is he's everywhere in the sense of how he does things, how he manipulates things, collusions, lies, deceit, cheating. Because remember, he hates Jacob. Remember, as his father was getting ready to die, and he came out of the tent, according to the writings, he said, once the day of my father has passed, you know, his death, he wanted to hurt Jacob bad, and that's why his mom sent him away to go to the, to the uncle. So, a couple of things about Esau that you need to know, and then we'll move forward. And I'm going to give you a definition to find in the dictionary, and what dictionary to use, because even the dictionaries, they've taken things out as you go through and as they modernize them, as they say, or update them. No, what they're doing is they're removing pertinent information, and very important information, so you can't find it. So I do a little more research, and I have some older material, and I also have people that you know, I work with that have a lot of old material and different things, and we discuss things, and we research them. So what you're getting is things that sometimes you can't find immediately, but I'm trying to give you the best sources I have that will help you find them, okay? So number one about Edom. Edom never went into captivity in Egypt. Edom or Esau, I'll say Esau. Esau never went into captivity in Egypt. When you see God sending Moses in there and bringing them out, Esau is not in there. He's not part of the 12 tribes. So Esau never went into captivity, which means on Mount Sinai when God made the covenant, he didn't make that covenant with Esau. All right? Number two, did research and found out, and I said it before, Esau is the forefather of the Romans. Esau is the forefather of the Romans. So when you think of the Roman Empire, then their influence had to come from their forefather, which would be Esau. So Esau descendants are Romans. All right? And again, I'm just giving you this so that you can understand when you're reading the scriptures and you're seeing how Rome has such an impact throughout the whole province they were they took over and all of Africa later on. And you'll understand that when you're reading it saying, wow, Esau people, and that's why when you read later on, you'll, you'll see uh, how not only did, was it Rome, but it was everything over, over in that entire territory for a long time until they finally started to weaken, but all they did was they weakened and they just moved out into smaller increments, but it was still Rome. All right? Now, I'm going to give you something to look up because I want you to take a moment and look things up. Doesn't mean right now. If you want to do it, if you got a couple of things, I'll do it. Now, this came from what was considered the Urban Dictionary. Urban Dictionary. So, in your Google search or your search engine, if you type in Urban Dictionary Edomite, Urban Dictionary Edomite, it'll give you a full description of who the Edomites are. It lets you know how unjust they are. And it's Urban Dictionary Edomite. Now, let me preface this quickly. I know a lot of uh, so-called great people who are listening. Well, that's not a proven dictionary. Well, it actually, it, it was. It really was. Because this definition of Edomite, when you put Urban Dictionary Edomite in your Google search or in your search engine, it was there in all the dictionaries. It was actually there in Zondervan. Uh, well, as far as you know what Zondervan is, it's Bible Dictionary. I don't know if it was in Nelson's Bible Dictionary, because I don't know how far back Nelson goes, or Topical Bible Dictionary. I'm not sure, but it was in Dondervan, the older ones. It was in there, and it was in other dictionaries. They moved it out. They took it out, and they got rid of it. So in, in that definition uh, concerning the Edomites, it gives you and explains to you who they are, how they run the government, how the systems they set up. It gives you the full disclosure of what they do, how they do it. And I know a lot of times people say, well, you know, I'm not sure. Well, look, it's up to you. I'm just giving it to you. I can't make you go look it up. 
but it's right there. And it tells you how they set up things. It tells you the system and how they do things and how they read. All they do is put things in order to kind of shock you. And then they redo the same thing on a higher or lower scale to influence more people. And it gives you the whole makeup right there of how they do it. So it's important that you understand that you know that's how it's done. And that definition will help you. So now uh, that, you, that you have that, you need to understand the Edomites are not nice people, all right, because their very heritage is to destroy Jacob and to rule the world. And if you notice their symbolisms through Rome were the eagle, well, what other country uses the eagle? They also use uh, slavery as a way of free labor. Well, what other countries use slave, uh, slave labor as free labor to build up the nations? And that's why it's important that you understand, because during the time of Christ, when he was on the earth, remember, you had Nicodemus who came to him. Nicodemus was very wealthy. You had Joseph of Arimathea, very wealthy. And you had other Israelites that were there, even though they were in captivity, they worked for Rome, but yet they were wealthy, even the Pharisees, they were well off. So you have to understand, uh, later on in the scriptures, when they're talking about those of, of like faith, of those that are in covenant with God, having this world's goods and seeing your brother and not helping them, it's not a new thing. That's what was going on back there. You see a lot of people who say that they know Christ who are very well off even today and won't help anyone. And that's a warning that was given even back then, even before that, uh, even during the time of David when he made a law and said, if you are Israel, then whether you fight or not, you share in the spoils. These things we've forgotten because why? We were, we've been in, in and out of our ancestors, have been in and out of slavery so much, and they've had to migrate into so many different systems, but yet they still wouldn't serve God. So finally God said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to put you in all over the world and put you into this last thing, uh, the last captivity, which is the seventh, is what we're in. This is our experience. I'm telling you some of their experience in the history. So let's go to Deuteronomy 28, because I want you to see what happened here so that you can get an understanding as we move forward. I'm Deuteronomy 28, all right? Deuteronomy 28. I'm reading out the New King James Version. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm just going to help you out a little bit. Deuteronomy 28, from chapter 1, I think it's all the way down to 14. Those are the blessings. Those are the blessings that God said he brought upon Israel and would bring upon them and keep upon them. Now, from 15 on down, yeah, those are the curses because they would not listen and obey to, of what he wanted. So let's go to Deuteronomy 28. Let's start in verse 47. I'm going to show you a couple of things that will help you to understand uh, what's happening and what took place because this is really, this is prophecy toward them. It says, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you. Now that's Deuteronomy 28, verse 47. And I'm in 48. And now watch, in verse 48. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in need of everything. Now he's saying here the enemies, he's talking about Israel being once again in captivity. And when he's saying in verse 48, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger. In other words, in order to eat, you have to serve them. In thirst, in order to get water, you have to serve them. And nakedness, in order to get clothes, you have to serve them. And in need of everything. So he's saying anything that you need, clothes, house, food, water, everything. We call it a job, you see? We call it employment. But he's saying, no, it's, that's what you call it. He said that you're really in captivity. Now, again, this is new for some of you guys, and I know you're going to challenge it, but it's right here in the manual. So you challenge it later on and go back and study the whole thing because I don't have time to go through the whole thing. I'm trying to get you to a place so you can start telling your brain to turn on and stop thinking or believing. Now watch. In nakedness and in the need of everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. So we all know yokes of iron. Now, if you want to put that in Google or whoever search you're using, you can put yokes of iron. And you watch all the different pictures that come up of all the different designs of yokes of irons that they did for slaves during the 
doing and right at the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade in which they came over here to this aspect of the world because the known world Africa and all those islands over there which they later changed called the West Indies those islands are part of Africa and if you do your research and you type into your Google search a place called Negro land Negro land it'll give you the history of the names of those countries before they changed the names before the Spanish the French you know uh, with Christopher Columbus and all those guys and the Dutch and all those people came over there and they started changing names and uh, the other people that were there helped in the transatlantic slave trade that bought over Judah and the Israelites throughout the whole world eventually but it was the Americas is what they call it now Gad was already in America when they started this we're going to touch a little bit of that so when you got to the West Indies they took them over there and they started calling changing the islands and calling them by islands or or by territory. That's why in the scriptures it says Jesus of Nazareth because he lived where? In Nazareth. So that's what they took upon themselves. So if you were taken over to an island that was a part of Africa, and this is right before the Suez Canal was split over there, the man-made Suez Canal divided it. All of those were part of Africa, all those thousands of islands, they just switched in and called it the West Indies. And then later on, you know, they had the big thing with Europe coming in and England and taking the territory and so on. But during this time in which they were doing, you had Benjamin who went over to the West Indies, all right? You also had Levi who went over to the West Indies. And so as you do that, and you understand Gad is there now in the country prior to 1492, all right? So if that's the case, then all this was in being initiated not only with the slave trade, which was for molasses, for alcohol, and also for people because they would you know, trade slaves as well as goods and supplies. And they also had a place over there called Timbuktu. Now you would hear about that and we laugh, but Timbuktu was number one in trade in the entire world at that time. Timbuktu. And it was, if they wanted any commodity, wheat, grain, or whatever, you came through Timbuktu. And why is that important? Because it shows you as you begin to understand that when they started and they moved over here for slave trade because of their disobedience and they put the yokes of iron around their neck all right now watch i want you to see this and he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you the yoke of iron used to look like two long irons and he had a yoke around your neck a long metal yoke that would circle your neck it also had two it had four it had one it had one that looked like a mask that went over your face it had a yoke around it and you you could only use your eyes to see and they could use that to pull or push you or grab you with a long stick and break you. Now, what, now watch what it says here in the Word. It says, until he has destroyed you. So in other words, what they're saying here, what God is saying here in Deuteronomy is, they're going to break you. When they say destroy you, he's talking about doing it to the point of keeping that yoke of iron on you until the point where every word they say you do, then they take it off. So they're teaching you new how to respond to different commands and different things and how to do things. And finally, when you have it, <clears throat> when you have it and you're doing what they tell you to do without even thinking about it, it becomes what? We call the term second nature. They take the yoke of iron off. Why? Because the scripture says here, he has destroyed you. Now, who are you? Are you Israel? Are you black? Are you American? Are you Haitian? Are you Jamaican? Who are you? Because who you were before is now what? Destroyed. So now they're going to tell you who you are because there's nothing there left because they destroyed it. That's how powerful the slave trade. And now they're doing it with systems, computers, fear. It's the same thing in the system. Remember the scripture says that men's hearts will fail them because of fear. Christ said that. So if that's the case, then they're still doing the same thing to break you into their system or to get you to do things automatically to the point where you don't even think about it. Well, well how do you know? Well, <clears throat> I just read it to you out of the manual. And then <laughs> let's go to verse 68. Let's go to verse 68. Let's skip over to verse 68 in Deuteronomy 28. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it talks about different things. But let's go to verse 68 because I want you to see so you can begin to, when you read this yourself, you begin to get better understanding. Verse 68, 28, Deuteronomy 28, 68. 
and the Lord will take you back to Egypt. Egypt is a place of what? Captivity or slavery in ships. Moses this did not get go over there in a ship. He went over there walking or with camels or things like that. And I know you, you know, study as well. Camels are ships of the desert. I, I got it. That's what they called them. But I doubt if our ancestors were brought over to this country on a camel through the ocean. Okay? Just a little bit of a guess. And the Lord will take you back to Egypt in ships by the way of which I said to you, you shall never see it again. And there you shall be offered for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one will buy you. Now, you know that's a slave auction. Now, I want you to write this term down. When it says no one will, in the original language, it says no one shall buy. That's important in the original language. No one shall buy. That word shall buy means to redeem or to recover. To redeem or recover. Now, you understand what he's saying, just in case. Now, I want to explain it to you. He's saying that the slaves are on the auction blocks. They're putting iron around their necks and they're now grabbing them and pulling them and they're doing all kinds of things. And they, you remember they came over on the ships, they were sick, they were all beat up. They had all kinds of scars on them and they would cover them with light tar to cover the, the tar, the, the wounds and stuff. And they would uh, do all kinds of things to them to make them look presentable so that they can get you know, wine and I'm, I'm sorry, molasses, alcohol, uh, different commodities for them as slaves and that's how they begin to build up the Americas and then with free labor and they did that all, all around the world and when it says and no one shall buy you he literally means to redeem or recover he's saying no one's going to interrupt that process and save you you see because remember when you talk about the Messiah we call him our redeemer you see so he's saying no one's going to redeem you right there so the, when, I, when they're going to be selling you as slaves to all these different countries and all these different nations no one's going to come in and interrupt it and say don't do it that's what he's saying so when you now consider how many of, of Israel of all the 12 tribes are all scattered throughout the world well that's one of the ways that they got there that's the main way through the curse of disobeying God's laws and I've always said this over and over if we understand uh that, then we have to understand it's imperative that we begin to obey God's laws so that he can rescue us and help us not only just in our hearts and in our minds, but in, through his word that he said that he hasn't forgotten us. Now here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. Write this down because now our ancestors are in America and all over the world, different places and they, you know, they have different ports and stuff that they have. I'm not going to get into that for time's sake. You do some research. I gave you some material to look at and you can study that and it will help you. But um, the thing that's interesting is when you see it and when you understand uh, what's going on, then you can look at it and say, wow, I, you know, I, I have to do a little more study and or, you know, check some more things out. And we all have to. Nobody's above it, all right? So now I'm going to give you five people and I'm going to explain to you what they did. Now remember, They've broken these people. And now, for the next, I don't know how long, I'm not giving it to you in chronological order, but I'm giving it to you so you can understand, so you can write these dates down, so you can understand what's happening to these that are in captivity in these countries. All right? Ready? Number one. I say number one, I don't but because I'm just giving you five things. So I'm going to read all the way across, and hopefully you'll get it. Okay, number one, John Smith created the Baptist religion in 1608. So in 1608, John Smith created the Baptist religion. All right? And it's very important you know that. Number two, Charles Parham. P-A-R-H-A-M. Charles Parham created the Pentecostal religion in 1901. In 1901. Charles Parham created the Pentecostal religion in 1901. Joseph Smith created the Mormon religion 
in 1830. In 1830, Joseph Smith created the Mormon religion. Number four, Charles Taze Russell. Charles Taze, T-A-Z-E, Charles Taze Russell created the Jehovah's Witness religion in 1872. You can look these up on Google and stuff. It'll, it'll be good. 1872. And finally, number five, William Miller created the Seventh-day Adventist religion in 1863. William Miller created the Seventh-day Adventist religion in 1863. So number one, John Smith created the Baptist religion in 1608. Number two, Charles Perham created the Pentecostal religion in 1901. Number three, Joseph Smith created the Mormon religion in 1830. Number four, Charles Taze Russell created the Jehovah's Witness religion in 1872. And number five, William Miller created the Seventh-day Adventist religion in 1863. Now you have a group of people who have just come, their descendants, who are just disobeying God. And God is prophesying what's going to happen to their descendants uh, in this land, which they're now in. And he's identifying to them, I'm sending you back because you won't listen, so I'm going to let you serve your enemies. And this is what they're going to do. Now remember, we'll go back one more time so you can get it. Deuteronomy 28, 48. I want to get it for you. Therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, in the need of everything. So anything that they need, who do they have to serve? Right. And that's why Christ said when he was on the earth, call no man master. But yet, when they brought the ancestors over, or the slaves over, what's the name they told them to call? That's right, master. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. Got it? He destroyed you. So now, here you are in a whole nother land. Yoke of iron finally comes off. You're programmed. You know what you can do, what you can't do. The clothes you got on belong to the owner of you. You're the owner. He's tattooing your body, doing all this stuff. A bunch of stuff going on that's not good. And here comes all these people coming to say, hey, this is what and how you know God. And this is the most incredible aspect of this first part. Is it's in Deuteronomy 28, 48, when he says everything you need, everything includes also wanting to know God again. So now you have all these people who have no foundation scripturally to come introduce you to God. How do I need to be introduced to someone who already knows me? Because remember, he's saying what's going to happen to his people. And they're telling you, this is the method. This is the method that we have decided or we have discovered that you can know God. This, we want to introduce this to you. Now, this is interesting because out of all the five people that I gave you, when you go through history, you'll see that they're Amalek or descendants of Edomites. So isn't it interesting? You do research. It's right there. You do your research that all these who are now saying, I want to introduce something to you, are all descendants of Esau. Hmm. And they've come for what's called introduction. So introduction, God never wanted with Israel because he knew who they were. God always wanted a meeting with Israel. Remember when he told Moses, build for me the tent of meeting. He wanted to meet with Israel. A meeting is different than an introduction. An introduction is someone else ascribing to you their personal knowing or saying they know this individual. If we're at an event, Let's make it something simple. If we're at an a, a event where there's some networking going on concerning uh, houses, building houses, and there's a gentleman there who's a roofer, I don't know the person, but you do. And you walk up to the person and say, hey, 
I want to introduce you to, and you begin to ascribe, tell me about this person. What you're telling me is this is how this is who this person is, but you're giving it to me from your perspective. Introduction is always someone else's perspective of the person or the deity. God didn't want that. That's why the scripture says there is yet one mediator between God and man. Do you see? So what he's what he's what re, this is doing is it's now introducing religion to Israel all throughout the world. So introduction, write these down, please. Introduces introduction is religion, science, fear, the pursuit of money, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye. The pride of life, death, and eternal damnation. I'll read them again. Introduction. Remember, they're introducing you something here. What is it's called? It's religion. It's science. Fear. Pursuit of money. You remember the objective for people is to pursue money. That's why Christ said, "No man can love what money and God." So He's letting you know. Your life journey should not be to produce money. But what do we tell our teenagers? Get that money. Chase that money. Got to get that paper. Got to get that paper. You're on the paper hunt all the time. Why? Because they're trying to convince them that's the most important thing. Christ said, no, no, no. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. So, religion, science, fear, pursuit of money, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life, death, and eternal damnation. That's what was introduced. That's why an introduction is very dangerous because introduction never meets the person. Oh boy. That's why when people say they have altar calls or they call people, they say, come, let us introduce you to. We want to introduce you to. Come on down front so you could, we want to introduce you to. Come on, I've been there. I was in those buildings. Come on down. We want to introduce you to him. Well, Meetings are different. Meetings are different. A person who is introduced has to depend on someone else, not the mediator, but someone else to tell them. Because you remember, our ancestors couldn't read this language and couldn't speak this language for a long time. So now you have all these different systems that are, in, that are going around them or around them every day and they're, they're people who are they're enslaved to. And you have Catholicism, you have Christianity, you have uh, all these other different things that are going on in the other parts of the world as well as this part. And so now they're being introduced to this. And so they're starting to integrate into these things. Why? Because they disobey. And I know, you know, so where we're going, just hold on, we'll get there, we'll get there. I'm in no hurry today because I want to take my time because you need to understand. Because when you understand what happened in your history, your history is so important to grasp because it keeps you focused on things that God has said he's going to do and he's going to rescue us and he's coming to get us. And even though you don't like a lot of the things that are going on, nobody does. Everybody doesn't like everything. Come on, you don't even like eating the same meal twice with the same thing. You try to add a little spice to it, you know. You're not going to eat something you know, the bland, as you call it. So I'm saying this is a grown-up message. So you're going to have to grow up and be taught I don't need to be exciting all over the place for every message because I'm trying to get you to see something here that you can go back and research and put it in your brain and your heart and start practicing it. All right, let's look at meeting. Write the word meeting down, please. Write the word meeting. What happens in a meeting? I'm giving you these now so we can get to the scriptures and then we're done. This isn't going to be a long message today because this is going to be a lot of thinking on your part and you're going to have to go back and research a lot of this stuff. That's why I said to you, I gave you this early because I want you to do some homework instead of just sitting there thinking that everything, you know, you, you got to do the work. You got to go read this stuff. doesn't matter how much I give you. doesn't matter how much I show you. If you're not going to go back and read it, you're going to forget it. Anybody would. Come on. You know the old uh, thing they say, the old saying, people say, out of sight, out of mind. You know, if, look, most of us learn things because of repetition, right? So please write this down in your notes if you struggle with reading or if you don't want to read or if you rebel against reading the number one way 
to remember anything is repetition. It doesn't matter. What anybody, that's number one. That's why they show you the same commercial on TV. They show you the same advertising. They show you the same athlete. They show you the same sport. Over and over and over and over, they show you the same thing until finally it ingratiates you. And you're like, okay, I'll go get that. Hey, I'm hungry. I'll go buy that. You know, that's what they do. And it's the same thing in the system. They keep throwing out fear, 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 until finally it breaks you. Well, what are you holding on to? All right. Meeting. This is what happens in meetings with the Father. Number one is the fear of God. Fear of God. When you're having a meeting, man, you're in that meeting, you're fearing that, that power, all power. We're going to talk about this a little more next week. Boy, you're going to love this study we're going to do. But i got to get this one out first. But, and I think next week will be the final part. You know, don't trust me on that yet. So, I'm saying, I think, I'll leave it there. Fear of God. Number two, prayer. When you're meeting with God, there's some prayer. Now, here's the interesting part. Prayer isn't just standing, and I told you before, yelling at the top of your lungs, screaming, say, oh, God, I mean, if that's where you want to start, this on you. I'm not telling you how to pray in your prayer time. That's your business. But all that yelling and screaming is not going to change anything. But you need to have prayer, and prayer doesn't just go one way. In other words, God's never going to pray that you don't get religious and, and ignorant. What I'm saying is you pray, but now you sit silently and wait to hear from the king. And you sit in honor and reverence of the king. Then there's fasting. Now fasting is different for everyone. I'm not here to tell you how to fast and what to fast. I fast. And fasting is different. Some people fast meat. Some people fast sweets. Some people fast food. Some people fast water, TV, uh, negative stuff. Whatever works for you. I'm not here to tell you what to fast. Again, uh, soon we will be fasting. And I'll let you know specifically what we're going to be fasting. Number three, um, next one, I'm sorry, obeying God's laws. That's what happens in meetings because when you're meeting with the Father, He's helping you and you're beginning to see and you begin to, you know, the laws. Okay, I need to obey this, I need to obey this. So you mean when I read the Bible, I'm having a meeting? Absolutely. Absolutely. Truth. Truth. See, the problem with the, the world system is there's no truth in it. And there's no, because there's no truth in it. That's what you're seeing. You're seeing the result of no truth. So everything is a lie. That's why the scripture says, let God be true and every man be a what? A liar. So if it's not founded and established upon God's principles, God's laws, precepts, and concepts, what is it? It's a lie. So in the meeting, you're learning what? Truth. Right? Where are you learning? Like David said, in my inward parts. That's what you desire. In the meaning also is integrity. Integrity. Now, integrity is simple to say, but it's not readily practiced by everyone because integrity really incorporates self-governing according to God's laws. And that's something that we don't, we've talked about over and over, and I'm going to reiterate that. You're supposed to govern yourself according to God's laws. So integrity doesn't mean that everybody's looking at you. It's really the opposite. It's when no one's looking. So it doesn't mean you're not going to mess up. You know, it doesn't mean when you're turning the TV and you see something, you don't stop. doesn't mean when you see that big cake with that icing flowing down and you don't stop and lick your lips or you go, man, I don't need that cake, but I'm sure I'm going to make it or go buy it. You know, uh, that's different. I'm talking about, you know, if you know the scripture says don't steal and, you, and you're by yourself and you hear, well, you stole that, you need to repent and say, Father, I, I repent. I stole that. And I realize that that is stealing. I, I didn't, I considered it not stealing, but I'm realizing now why. Because we've had this meeting, and that's stealing. So I need to stop. You see? And finally, reason. Reason. In Isaiah chapter 1, God said, come, let us reason together. Why is reason so important? Please write this definition down for the word reason. Reason is simply the intellectual conclusion before the action. The intellectual conclusion before the action. So when you sit down with the Father and you reason with him, he gives, you the, the, he gives you the answer in spite of the problem. The answer he gives you navigates through the problem. So that's why it's important that you reason. So in the meeting, there's reasoning. Reasoning doesn't sit, mean that you sit there and make excuses. That's not what it means. When he said, come, let us reason together, all right, he's already, he already knows that our sins are there. But he tells us, Though your sins be like scarlet, 
You see, he's letting you know, I know you messed up, but I'm going to wash them. And then he wants, he gives you, the, there's a lamb coming. There's a lamb coming that's going to take care of you. Just, I'm, I'm reason, listen, there's a lamb coming. See, because the penalty of death, hell, death, and the grave weighed on us so much, and it was hurting us and frustrating us, and we couldn't function because we knew no matter what, we were doomed. He said, I'm going to take care of that. I'm going to take care of that. So in a meeting, let's go quickly, and then we'll get into the meat of this, and we'll be done. Like I said, not a long one today, but something to make you really think. A meeting is the fear of God. That's what the scripture says. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So when you go into this meeting, you're going to meet because as you meet, you learn to fear God more and more. His power is endless. You, you know, you don't even want to know. Prayer, because in there you will pray before you go, sometimes after you leave. Prayer. And it's not so much sensitivity and stuff. It's discipline. You're learning discipline on how to pray. I need to pray. I need to pray. Fasting. You'll start sitting up saying, you know, I'm not really hungry. I'm hungry, but I don't want that. I don't want this. Could it be I need to fast and talk to the Father? Could I, do, I just need to leave food alone because he's trying to talk to me or something? Or I need to not watch this? I don't know. I'm just saying that's what happens. Obeying God's laws and truth. Obeying God's laws. So you start obeying. You start obeying. You start obeying. You start doing it and it becomes so normal. That's why Christ said, take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy. And you begin to obey and obey and obey. And then truth. And you notice that when you start speaking, pardon me, and you notice when you start speaking that you begin to talk more of truth. And it doesn't mean you are a liar. I'm not saying that. I wouldn't say that about you. I don't know you. And I would never call you that unless you have lied to me. So if you lied to me and you have told a lie, I have to tell you because I love you and I care for you. That was a lie. You need to repent for that. That wasn't truth. But I'm not going to publicly say it out loud and embarrass you. But some people do struggle with truth or saying things or telling the story. You know, you go fishing and you caught a fish this big. By the time you tell everybody, it's this big. Well, what is that? That's a lie. So you got to go back and say, look, I, I went fishing. This is what I caught and this is what I threw back. That's the truth. Integrity. Integrity is self-governing. You have to govern yourself. The Word of God will govern you once you get it inside you, and that's what it's designed to do. But if you don't obey it, how is that governing? You're going to, listen, as long as you are in this world, you are going to be tempted. I don't care who you are. Drugs, alcohol, women, men, stealing, lying, false documents, all this, because that's what the system is built on. All right? You need to be an integrous person. Reason is when you sit down and start talking to the Father and listening. And what is reason? The intellectual conclusion before the action. That's when God begins to dis give you the answer before the puzzle. In other words, you're sitting there trying to figure out how things are going to be done. He'll tell you, you know what? Do this, make this call. Do this, do this, do that, do this. I get, you know, let's go to Isaiah 1. I wasn't going to do it. Let's go quickly because I think some of you need to see this which will help you. This is a real quick and I'm not, you know, I, I'm not trying to uh, make it seem like you don't know, you do know, but Isaiah 118, are you there? Isaiah 118 says, come now, Isaiah 118, New King James Version, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. So God wants to reason with you. He wants to tell you some secret things, some answers. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. In other words, it's, you're not, it's not over with you yet. It's nowhere near over. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You ever see wool? Beautiful how white it is. Then he says, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So he's telling you, I'm going to help you. And you're set to be delivered. <clears throat> you're set for everything to work for you. Because you are the church. Because remember, in captivity, in bondage, it's the church. And now these other people are coming who are catching us, our ancestors in captivity. And they're saying, let us introduce you to religion. And we'll call this building the church. Are you seeing and now move forward in your mind till today. That's what you see. That's what you see all over the world. 
So, <clears throat> are they teaching you what God said you ought to be taught? Mm. Okay, probably not. Are they teaching you that who you are and how you got here? Probably not. I, I don't know, I don't know every church. But remember, I just gave you five of the top 10 religions in the world. And they're still teaching the same thing they started back. And remember, they taught all this while people while they were yet in slavery, except for 1901. But in 1901, there was still segregation. You still were treated as a slave. And if you want to get technical, it hasn't ended because through the different avenues of law, they just put it under a different section, but it still reads back into the original writ. You understand? So as long as you don't, it doesn't incorporate this. But when you do, it brings it together. That's the way it works. So they haven't obliterated it. They haven't done away with it. They just gave you a, basically a lifetime out and said, as long as you don't violate this, this doesn't apply. That's not freedom. That's still captivity. That's a noose. You just don't see it. Okay, so how do we start getting ourselves together? Let's go to Psalms 111. Psalms 111. Psalms 111. And verse 10. Psalms 111 and verse 10. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. This is a major key. He's saying now, in order for you to be able to come out of those religious ideas and ideologies that have been setting you for years, the first thing is you're going to have to repent. And you have to realize the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, Father, I repent. I, I, I was following those things I didn't know. Well, none of us knew. I mean, we all came from somewhere from, you know, being taught wrong because our ancestors were taught wrong. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. So he's saying in order for you to break free of that mindset of those things that they put in you, you're going to have to start obeying God's commandments. You're going to have to go back and see, okay, the Sabbath is Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown. I need to start obeying the Sabbath. You see? That's what he's saying. As you begin to read and research and begin to apply what God said he wanted the church to do on Mount Sinai when he began to give out the commandments, you shall not steal. Honor your father and your mother. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. He's saying as you begin to do that, that's how you break free of that system. Are you saying that? That's awesome. That's what he's saying. As you do it, you begin to break free of the system. So the first thing you have to understand is as you hear this, you begin to apply it. And as you apply it, as you apply it, as you apply it, it becomes so regular and so normal to you. It's like, that's it. I can do this. Yes, you can do all things. That's the way it works. All right? Let's go to Exodus 4. Oh, we only have a couple more. We're done today. Like I said, we're not going to, because we had a lot last time. You're getting quite a bit of more heaviness this time. And then we're going to lighten it up next time and I think that's it and by the time you put all three together you are going to be able to see much clearer than you've seen before in a lot of areas Exodus 4 Exodus 4 so remember it's not just reading it you have to apply it start with the basics start with the laws are you honoring your father and your mother are you not stealing are you committing adultery you have to stop man God takes that so serious you remember the woman who was bought out in adultery? We always talked about it. Where was the man? The law said the man and the woman should have been brought out. So he, even if the woman was married, because if you understand the reading, it's the woman who was married, but the man was still the part of the act. That's why when Christ said, let he that's without sin among you cast the first stone. Look, everybody here got something we're not doing right. Don't get it twisted here. But this is the dispensation in which we get it right. That's why we study to show ourselves approved unto who? God. So as we get it, we begin to apply it. It doesn't make sense to get it and not do it because you're going to do somebody. You're going to follow somebody's yoke. Somebody's yoke is on your mind, your heart. You're going to listen to somebody. doesn't matter what you do. You're going to listen to some. We're all going to follow somebody's philosophy. We might as well follow the original philosophy that God had for us in the beginning. All right? So go to Exodus 4, <clears throat> 11. Apologize. This is Moses, God sending him back to Egypt to rescue 
Send him down to Egypt because you remember Moses originally ran from there. It's 40 years later, he's coming back. God's sending him down. He's having an encounter with him at the bush, all right, the burning bush. We're going to talk about that more next time. I really want to share it right now, but i got to learn some discipline in my own life not to go too far ahead because it's really exciting some things that were discovered here, all right? So in 411, Exodus 411, stop urging me on to share it right now. I hear you. And uh, <laughs> it says, so the Lord said to him, he's talking to Moses, who has made man's mouth? That would be him, the Lord. Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? <clears throat> Pardon me. So who, who makes all those? The Lord. Have not I the Lord? So he's saying, it's me who makes everything. And that's how powerful and oh man, just incredible. Verse 12. Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall say. I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall say. And he's reminding Moses everything, the deaf, the blind, the mute, your mouth, all that I made. Oh man, well how powerful is that? You're, he said, I made your mouth. He said, now, he said, now in verse 12, he said, now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what to say. In other words, I'm going to give you the word. I'm going to put my words in your mouth and teach you what to say. So as we get into the word, as we obey God's laws, as we study, as we pray, as we have these meetings with him, God is putting his words even now in our mouth. And when things happen, you think it's you, but it's not you. Because he never told Moses, it's your responsibility. He said, you go. And I'll be with your mouth. And I'll teach you what to say. Right? That's right here. Let's go to Matthew 10. Come on. I want you to see this. This is exciting. Oh, we only have two more. We're done today. I have much more to give you, but I said I'm going to keep it right here. Because I don't want to over, over you. I know a lot of you guys are like, oh, it's a lot of notes and stuff. I'll grow up. I have no problem sitting there watching TV. I have no problem sitting there doing other stuff. You sit here for an hour, hour and 15 minutes and cry like a big, big... Anyway, um, Matthew 10. <laughs> Matthew 10. Are you there? All right. And then we're going to go to verse... Let's start in verse 19. Matthew 10, 19. Let's go to verse 18. It says, You will be bought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Verse 19. But when they deliver you up, do not worry on how or what you shall speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Isn't that the now look? Isn't that the same thing he told Moses? Come on, that's Exodus 4, 11 and 12. He said, my, my, I'm one with your mouth and put my words in it. Christ is saying the same thing. It's the same thing. He said, when they bring you before, who was Moses going before? Pharaoh. Who was Pharaoh considered? A god of Egypt. Right? He was their highest ranking god or official. So he's letting you know, they're going to bring you before officials, governing officials. He said, don't you dare worry about what you're going to say. Oh, come on. That's right here in the manual. This is some good stuff. He's saying, don't worry about what you're going to say. Uh, let's go back to verse 19. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given. Watch this. For it will be given. I'll read it slow. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Come on. He's saying the same thing. He's saying the same thing. He's like, look, you keep spending time, you keep praying, you keep fasting, you keep reading, you keep living a life of integrity, you keep obeying these laws, you learn about the ceremonial laws, you learn about the Sabbath, you learn about the holy high days, you keep learning about those things. You're waking up, you say, keep going, keep going. They're going to ridicule you, they're going to talk about you. 
You don't even worry about what to say because when they come at you or say something to you, oh, it's my spirit that's going to speak. Come on, that's good stuff. That's good stuff to know that he's with us even now. He's with us. Yes, he's with us. The Most High is with Israel. He's with his chosen people. And remember, Israel is everywhere, scattered. Christ said, let the wheat and tear grow together. I'm not here to tell you who's Israel and who's not. I'm telling you those that are obeying and following his laws, those are the ones. Now, we know Judah was bought over on the ship and stuff and everything, which, you know, are the kings, which are some of the first to rise. So don't, you know, don't get all crazy and, oh, what do I do? No, no. It's right here in the manual. Do your part. Do what God expects of us. And God said, I got you. What did he tell Moses? Go. What did he tell you when he told the disciples? Now go into all the world. It's the same thing. All right? And remember Matthew 16. Oh, we got another four extra minutes. Matthew 16, you remember when Christ said, who do men say that I am? Oh, but we'll come to that. Go to Colossians. Let's go to Colossians first. Because I want you to see this. This is, this is awesome. Remember he said, I'm, I'm trying not to say it. But I'm saying it anyway, what I'm trying not to say. I'm not good at not saying some things when I hear it. I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have said it right there. Because now I got to go show them. That's how it works. I like that. I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have said it. Here it is. <laughs> said it? Here we go. Yeah. So, Colossians uh, chapter 1. And, uh, and then in your manual, also go to Matthew 16 and put something there. Matthew 16. We talk about this all the time, but you know, just we're going to keep going. Matthew 16, 13. When Christ said, But when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Remember, the people are saying he's a prophet, not the disciples. He's saying, Who do men? this whole region of Judea and all that. Who are they saying I am? They're saying a prophet. That's what they're saying. You're, you're a prophet. All right? He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Verse 17, Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar means son of, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock, who's the rock? He is. The stone, the builders rejected, has become the chief cornerstone. He is the rock. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, shall not prevail against it. And upon this rock, not upon Peter, who's the rock? Oh, Christ. And upon this rock, upon Christ, upon him being our king, upon us obeying our king, upon us following his laws, his precepts, his concepts, I'm going to build. I'm going to find those that will follow and do what I tell them to do. Come on, it's right here in your manual. Now, go to Colossians 1, verse 15, and watch. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him, who is him, Christ, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Not just through him, but for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church. Woo, wait a minute. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. So when he rose, remember, back Mount Sinai in the wilderness, part one we talked about it, kingdom of priests. He said, okay, we need a king. Representative, lamb. Lay down, got up, here he is, our king. Watch this statement again. Verse 17. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body. So the church in this writing is considered the body. The head is the authoritative figure of all power, all rights, 
all kingdoms, all authority, all insurance, all creativity, all insight, all revelation, all understanding, all knowledge, all seeing, all knowing, all in all is who he is. The church is Israel and the covenant that he made with them. Who is the beginning? In other words, when he got up, that sent a big signal to them through prophecy that not only has God fulfilled that aspect and the animal sacrifice and all that stuff are over, we need to start getting it together. Because now listen, this is why they tell you that's the New Testament from that point on. It's not the New Testament, but it's starting the end of the cycle of this system. Because the end of the cycle is the acknowledgement of the king. When he came to the earth, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So after he rose, he said, now all authority has been, all power and authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He said, now therefore you go. You go. And he said, as you go, preach this gospel. The kingdom of heaven is upon you. You see? So he's saying the same thing. And he's saying, the firstborn from the dead, which means if you die in him, he's going to raise you. Because he's going to raise you. That's the resurrection. Remember? Mary, talking about Lazarus, he, he's dead, he's dead. He said, we had a whole conversation, I'm just getting through it quickly. And said, I know he will live again in the resurrection. Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life. You see that? So he's letting you know that the key or the fact that he rose, you are going to rise. He's talking about his church. You're going to rise. Watch. From the dead, that in all things, he may have preeminence. He runs it all. Everything's subject to him. Everything. Doesn't matter what it is. It's his. And he's saying he has preeminence in everything. Everything. He is the head of the church. Not the apostle. Not the pastor. Not the teacher. Not the evangelist. Not the reverend. You know the word reverend is not even in the Bible. Not all these titles that people throw at you. They're not the head. Christ is the head of everything. So when people tell you this is my church, oh no. When they tell you this is my place, this is my building, this is my ministry, this is my, what does the manual say? That's why this is my gospel. It can be your gospel. This is the gospel of the Christ and my gospel. Oh, good pleasure of God. You can, if you get that, you got it. That's what the Apostle Paul said. See, you've got to understand. When you start obeying and obeying, you understand something. Yeah. Yeah, this is how I'm supposed to live. It's not, people are not going to like it. They're going to criticize me and ridicule me and laugh at me and try to break me. That's what the system does. But I'm not going to give in. Why? Because there's a resurrection coming. There's a greater king. Look, Hebrews announced it clearly that Moses forsook the temporary gratification of Egypt. Come on. You're going to give up eternal life? God chose you as the church? You're going to give up eternal life and disobey all these laws for temporary gratification? That's going to last your lifetime in comparison to being with Christ, the Father, the Holy Spirit forever? God just wants a meeting with us every day. Let's go. Exodus 19. We're going to park here today. We're going to park here today. Exodus 19. I hope you're getting something. Go back and watch this. Post this everywhere. Keep watching it until you get it. This is Israel at Mount Sinai. Like I said, I tell you things and I want to go back and show it to you because I want you to write notes and I want you to grasp this and be able to go back and show it so that you can share it. All right? Exodus 19, and we're going to start in verse 16, then we're going to park here today. Exodus 19, 16. This is the father. He already told Moses he's coming down on the third day. Ooh, I got to wait. I don't want to get back to it. That's why I don't come over here too much to these sections. Because Let me tell you, I don't think in my lifetime I can really teach you enough about Genesis and how deep it is. So I want to be, I want to apologize to that. I'm, I'm limited. I have a certain amount of lifespan like the rest of us. That Genesis is so deep, it don't even make no sense how much revelation and insight God has in there. Exodus, Leviticus, no, oh, forget about it. You'll be here, your great-great-grandkids. That's why 
each generation is supposed to be really serious about the coming of Christ and getting it together. All right? Exodus 19. God is getting ready to come down and visit. Watch this, verse 16. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain. This is Mount Sinai. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. So here the Lord is coming down and ascending on a mountain. And here Moses is walking up toward the mountain. And he's bringing the entire nation, all 12 tribes of Israel, to have a meeting. Not an introduction. He knew who they was. He sent Moses. He said, the cry of my children, the Israel, has come up unto me. Therefore, I'm sending you to get them. We need to prepare our hearts daily for a meeting, a tent of meeting, not an introduction. It shouldn't be so long that you have read and prayed that you have to introduce yourself to God. Why do you think your, our continual disobedience that on that day when Christ said, I never knew you, how is that possible unless you were not obeying what he said? that would disqualify you from eternal life. Are you getting it now? And that's what the psalmist said in 110. Fear of God. I got to start obeying. <clears throat> then I'm having these meetings with my king. But as long as I'm not obeying, and as long as I'm not spending time with him, it's just an introduction. Introduction is not going to get you in the kingdom. Introduction, he didn't... It, God never introduced himself to Adam one time in Emmanuel. Adam knew who he was. God knew who Adam was. He didn't need no introduction. No introduction for Moses or whatever. None of them. But isn't it funny on that day in Matthew 24, he's going to say, many shall say to me, Lord, Lord. He's going to say, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Here's proof. <clears throat> God never, never required us to be introduced. He expects us in the meeting every day. So we have a tent of meeting every day that we're supposed to have with our king. Husband and wife, children, family. Why? Because that's what it's about. It's about meeting with the father every day. I don't know how long. I'll never tell you that. But doggone it, which one would start in 10 minutes? Start learning how to bring your mind under subjection and start thinking of his goodness and and praising him in your mind instead of wondering about shopping and who's on sale and what's going on. You have to bring yourself to that place. That's called discipline. And it takes a moment to do it. So you can pray 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon, 10 minutes at dusk, 10 minutes later on. Before you know it, you pray two hours the whole day and it's just been 10 and 15 minute increments. You don't think that way, but you can do it. Why not do it? What's stopping you? One more time. Verse 17. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. He didn't come to introduce them to God. They knew about God. They were in captivity because they disobeyed him. A lot of religion in our generation for a lot of years. But as we begin to obey the word according to the scriptures, that stuff will start coming out. Are you willing to meet with the Father again? Or are you still happy with settling with lukewarm life of being introduced to him every day? Introduction isn't covenant. We have covenant. We have to meet with him. You, you can't change it. The, the covenant is established. We talked about it in part one. You can't change the rules. He expects you to meet with him. Notice, when he came down, Moses brought him out. He 
He expected that. He expects to hear from you daily. Not always bad. No, just sit and talk to him. Do his word. Pick up his word. <clears throat> I haven't done this yet. <clears throat> I haven't learned this part. And I'm learning now, Father. I repent. I want to change the way I'm thinking. I want to start doing this. I want to start obeying the Sabbath. So I, I need to start preparing. I, I want to learn about your feast the right way, not the fake ones. Because who do you think taught us all these holidays that aren't in the Bible or the manual? Didn't they come from the time of us, our ancestors being in captivity throughout all the world? These things aren't in the manual, but they're ingratiated in us. And when they come around, everybody, you are this, you're happy this, marry this, all this stuff, mothers, they follow them. And when you don't participate, they get mad. <clears throat> well, Christ said, woe unto you. The world hated you. No, they hated me before they hated you. you gotta, it's not a choice. This is part of who we are. It's when we lay it down and fit in. In front of them, they're like, oh, you are so nice. You're so open-minded. But behind your back, they're laughing at you. Weak. Wimpy. Why? You don't think they know. I'm going to leave that scripture alone today. So, I pray you got something today. That's it for today, for the Sabbath. Do some studying, research some stuff. And the most challenging aspect is, until you decide you're going to start obeying, you'll never be set free from where you're at. That's none of us. Is it always easy? Uh, let's say it this way. I've been in bondage so long that bondage has a false sense of security, but I know that there's an eternal damnation hooked to it or linked to it because I know that I'm not doing right. That's in all of us that are disobeying. That's the way it was. That's why the Bible says sin is fun for a season. You see? Because when it comes to an end, there is a day of reckoning. So let's deal with this up front for one minute. I can't tell you where you're at. I don't know where you're at. But the one who sees all knows. I can't tell you, <clears throat> pardon me, if you're obeying the truth or not. I don't know, but it's a good day to stop being lukewarm and stop making excuses. I'm not saying you can't watch sports or TV. I'm getting into all that. What I'm saying is, you aren't spending any time in the Word. You're not doing any praying. You're just reacting to everything that's going on around you. It's religion. It's going to get better. You just keep believing. It's nowhere in the scripture. So if you will obey me, I'll help you. Why? I need to know that you value what I value. And you're going to respect what I respect. Why when God says it like that, you take it as an offense. But when your boss says it like that, you don't say a word, but you grumble behind their back. Well, considering God's everywhere, even before you say it, he hears it. So let's focus and let's prepare our hearts to meet. Father, for those of us who you've called to be in covenant, and I say that seriously because I don't know where, are they, where they are throughout all the world, but they're everywhere. Let us turn our hearts back toward you and let us hear clearly what we need to do. I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of truth that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened. Open our heart and our mind once again to your truth. Let us desire this meeting more than anything else with you daily. And let us purpose to do and obey. For therein is where life, eternal life, resides. We thank you, honor, and we bless you. And we say thank you for helping us to see and obey your truth. In your holy name, Christ our King, it is written, so be it. So now, it's on you, let's go. You can do this, a little bit at a time, a little here, a little there, we'll talk about that. Precept here, a little bit, you know, a little precept there, precept there. We'll talk about that more next time, then we'll get into uh, some more stuff that's really gonna help you. But here's the big question. Are you willing to do what you just heard and what you've been hearing? It's time for me. I'm asking you to take. I don't have to 
ask you about giving or whatever, you know what you want to give, what is what to do. I mean, it's posted and everything. If not, somebody who's doing it there or, or typing, just post the information. I'm asking everybody under the sound of this voice who's hearing this message. Five minutes. Five minutes. Meet with them for five minutes. Don't call nobody, don't talk to anybody. Well, husband and wife, of course. But I mean, don't do anything extracurricular. And just take five minutes right now. And I'm going to get out of here. And you spend with your father in a meeting. And listen to what he's saying. Not just in your brain. Put your heart in your brain and align and say, look, I know I've been slacking. That's you. Or I know I can do better. Or thank you for what you brought me to right now. I'm excited. See, it's not always negative. You can just sit there and tell him how great he is. Praise him and just praise him. I don't know. Five minutes. He'll remember it. And heaven will record it.